Hello everyone, I'm Paris Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to 12 O'Clock High, a podcast on business leadership with Tom Fox, hosted by Richard Lummis. Hello and welcome to another episode of 12 O'Clock High, a podcast about leadership. This is Richard Lummis, I'm here with Tom Fox for another discussion on how to improve our leadership skills. We believe leadership is a skill which can be improved with study of both good and bad practices. We try to draw interesting examples from many sources, including history, fiction, film, and business writing. Welcome back, Tom. Thank you, Richard. Today, we're continuing our new our series of podcasts discussing economic disasters, financial panics, and market bubbles. Today, we're going to cover one of the most famous and most brief financial panics in American history, the Panic of 1907. In a short summary, the panic began in October 1907 when the Heinz brothers attempted to corner the market for shares in the United Copper Company, which they felt was being undervalued by short sellers. They came up short in the attempt, and the banks and trust companies that had lent the Heinz money began to suffer run on their deposits as depositors lost confidence. Since this was the days before the federal deposit insurance, if you were the last one to try to get your money out, you lost it. The Knickerbocker Trust Company, New York's third largest trust company, was forced to close and the panic was on. Banks refused to lend other banks money, lest they themselves be caught in a liquidity crisis, and by October 24th, nine banks and trusts had failed and more were teetering. At this point, J.P. Morgan stepped in. He personally put $3 million in cash in the Trust Company of America to keep it solvent. Two days later, the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury called Morgan and placed $25 million in government funds at his disposal to inject liquidity into the system. Morgan also began arm-twisting other financial titans. John D. Rockefeller Sr. put $10 million into the United Trust and promised another $40 million if needed. Morgan called the large bank presidents to his office on October 24th and announced that unless they raised $25 million in the next 10 to 12 minutes, the New York Stock Exchange would be forced to close early. The banks came up with the money. The stock exchange stayed open until the usual closing time, and the situation was saved. The Panic of 1907 is generally credited with being responsible for the creation of the Federal Reserve. The contrarian view is that it shows government intervention was not needed here, so it really isn't needed elsewhere. Tom, where would you like to begin today's, today's discussion? Richard, actually, I would like to begin today's discussion with a shout out to the Federal Reserve. In researching uh, for this podcast, I came across two uh, online sites that the Federal Reserve maintained that, frankly, I had no idea. Uh, One is the Federal Reserve History, which is entitled Your Gateway to the History of the Federal Reserve System, uh, with an excellent article by uh, John Moen and Willis Tallman on the Panic of 1907. I really had no idea that the Fed uh, produced this type of uh, research material for public consumption uh, or uh, allowed its uh, employees uh, to post articles. And it was an excellent article. Um, You know, it came from the Fed, and I know they would disclaim anything about it, but still the Fed. Um, The second thing was, which astounded me even more and actually makes me even prouder, was something called... um, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis Economic Education. And they had an entire uh, teaching lesson plan around the Panic of 1907, including J.P. Morgan, including the Trust. It is a, um, I think about a 25-page lesson plan for high school students. And the concepts, let me just run through these and, and see if these strike you as something that high school students should be, could be or should be studying bank run, bank panic, cartel behavior, central bank, liquidity, money trust, monopoly, Sherman Antitrust Act, and trust. Um, and I found this to just be stunning. Um, and it has uh, questions, objectives, student uh, learning objectives. It has supplementary materials. It uh, lists out the uh, lesson plan the teachers can go through. It lists out the questions they can pose both in class and as homework assignments. Uh, I frankly learned about as much uh, on the Panic of 1907 reading the lesson plan as many of the other um, pieces of uh, research material we we read in this case. So a huge shout out to the Fed. I had no idea that they put this out for uh, public consumption. And uh, all I can say is uh, please keep it up. Yeah, I I, I found uh, both those resources invaluable. Um, A couple of things uh, that I thought were... um, really interesting uh, about this uh, panic of 1907. Um, The um, camp set of the panic from American independence through the 19th century 
and into the t- early 20th century, panics were a recurring feature of the domestic financial market. They occurred with astonishing regularity and were often followed by serious recessions, even depressions. This um, He looked at to the concept of financial panics by focusing on this one, what turned it around, and the Finally, we're to a point of leadership in one of these podcasts, and the leadership of J.P. Morgan, uh, in this case, that I'll have some remarks on later. Um, I hadn't really thought about financial panics leading to recessions and depressions, but he's absolutely right on that point. Uh, we had uh, legislation that you uh, referenced come out of this panic, and uh, with one perhaps notable or two perhaps notable exceptions. We've done pretty well in terms of panics, um, if not recession slash depression since that time. So we had a, a government response, but it was, in this case, leadership. And uh, I don't think we talk about crisis leadership very much on this podcast. Perhaps uh, we should uh, think about that a little bit more. But it wasn't crisis as to get your gun and man the ramparts. It was crisis in terms of a financial crisis, clearly understood. But what are our options and what do we need to do? And uh, the steps taken by Morgan, uh, you mentioned uh, the Knickerbocker Bank. Uh, He sent his most trusted auditor to look at the books at the Knickerbocker Bank and see if, or Knickerbocker Trust, to see if an injection of cash would save it. And they, um, his... um, auditor uh, said, no, it was not uh, solvent and it could not be saved. But uh, that same auditor looked at other uh, financial institutions, trusts and banks, and made a different uh, calculus. So uh, you had a very reasoned approach. Uh, Then getting to the extraordinary steps that you also detailed, uh, first was where Morgan injected $3 million into Trust Company of America to keep it solvent. That was based on his auditor finding that the company was basically solvent. Uh, we had the extraordinary step of the Secretary of the Treasury placing $25 million uh, to Morgan for his disposal as an injection in the system. And in the stock market, uh, near crash, um, where literally $25 million was made available, I think, on 24 hours' notice. and but Basically, th- not even on a signature. Right. Uh, and uh, Morgan, the next step was, uh, I think he got uh, other bankers in a room, and they... Um, they put together another $10 million yeah. on the spot. Uh, we have seen bailouts uh, in our lifetimes of financial institutions. If we go back to the last century, long-term capital was one. <clears throat> we did not see one in, in Lehman Brothers, uh, but we saw other bailouts around the uh, 2008 financial crisis. But this was literally a uh, leadership from a man who was senior, seasoned in his professional experience, who understood the market perhaps as well as anyone um, the other um, thing that he he understood, he had uh, part of his professional uh, <clears throat> uh, life had been in England. So he understood the English banking system. He understood that the English could call upon uh, gold reserves from the United States. And so he had to uh, assure the English bankers that the species in the American economy was going to be backed sufficiently by gold because we're still on the gold standard at this time. They really didn't focus on that. But uh, his relationships with uh, bankers in England and his knowledge of the English banking system, I think, was another critical factor in uh, what kept uh, all of this afloat. So the the leadership aspect by Morgan, although he was vilified before and after, in this instance, uh, I thought was just outstanding. Well, and you're right, but it's I guess it also goes to an aspect of leadership we don't talk about a great deal, which is reputation. And his reputation in England and with the other bank presidents um, and brokerage houses and so forth in America was simply sterling. Uh, he was a man of his word. He was could be utterly ruthless. Um, at the time, he controlled, I believe, about half of the railroads in the, in the country, most of U.S. steel. He'd put together that, the first billion-dollar corporation. Um, he had been one of the early backers of Edison and the electrification of the uh, of the country. Um, so, uh, but I think his reputation for for probity was was unquestioned. Um, so I don't want to be the old white guy on the couch here, 
Um, but it, it just struck me that um, one of the things that you can garner from having a full uh, professional existence and full business uh, uh, set of business experiences is when the crisis strikes or the, the challenge arises, if you can rationally evaluate the situation, uh, you have skills you can bring to bear. And those skills are greater knowledge of the system because you've been in that system for 20, 30, or 40 years. Yeah. And that was the other thing that really struck me. Uh, <clears throat> having been in those systems, he knew them better than anyone, probably better than anyone in the government. And he was able to use the tools he had coupled with his reputation, <clears throat> coupled with his personal financial wealth, uh, to uh, save a, a panic from spiraling out of control. Uh, I, you mentioned the, the short nature, uh, short-term duration of this, three weeks, but it's also confined to a geographic area, yeah. L- largely lower Manhattan. <laughs> uh, so time and scope uh, was, uh, I think, with uh, Morgan that uh, he knew everyone. And he could uh, literally, if if he didn't pick up the phone and call him in, in 1907, he could send him a messenger. And if you got something from J.P. Morgan, I think you paid attention to it. Well, that's one thing I would like to discuss was the, uh, and, and to the Federal Reserve's great credit, in their lesson plan, they uh, published a number of satirical articles, um, which basically said you know, Morgan did this for his own benefit. Uh, he didn't want to get caught up in a crisis any more than anybody else. So he doesn't deserve any credit for public spiritedness for what he did. What do you think about the relationship in this case between self-interest and serving the public good? Um, I'm often asked that question in my other role as a speaker on business ethics and compliance. And my answer always is, if you can do good and make money, go forth and prosper, my son. (laughs) And that if your uh, individual interests are intertwined with a greater public good, I see absolutely no reason not to engage in that activity. And I completely reject uh, those uh, commentary on Morgan for this for this incident. There may have been others. You're absolutely correct. He was ruthless, um, a ruthless financier when it suited him. But it, in this situation, he saw the destruction of the New York financial system as uh, something that could not allow he could not allow to happen and he took steps to do so if it propped up his bank if it kept his investments uh, more whole uh, god bless him well there was an incident involved in this that i had not heard of before which was one of the brokerage firms that was in danger of of going belly up happened to have a large position in a company called tci steel and morgan wanted to prop the brokerage company up by by buying these shares from it and then merging the company into U.S. Steel. The problem is there were antitrust laws at the time. So he sent a couple of his guys, including uh, Henry Frick, to visit with the president of the United States, a man named Theodore Roosevelt, who's not known to have a great sympathy for the moneyed interests or the trusts. And Roosevelt assured them that he would not enforce the antitrust laws against this transaction, even though it clearly violated them. Um, let me contrast that in 2008 when the Secretary of the Treasury called the um, uh, the President of Bank of America and asked him to buy Washington Natural, Washington Mutual, <laughs> and uh, said, don't worry, we won't enforce any anti-competitive laws against you, to which uh, Bank of America asked for that in writing. They never got it in writing. We had a new administration, and two years later, they were sued. Yeah. And... Uh, the, the point is uh, the inflexibility of laws when they damage a greater society, uh, <clears throat> you have to take that into account. And I had originally thought in the 2008 crisis they were going to do things that they not would not normally do because it's not normally a crisis. And the thing that Morgan did uh, in terms of uh, that situation was absolutely correct, and the Bank of America purchasing Washington Mutual was absolutely correct and absolutely needed. And then, unfortunately, they turned around and got sued for uh, all of Washington Mutual's bad loans. Yeah. That's a fair comment. Uh, and in terms of the of the short duration of this, the, uh, the stock market had apparently fallen by half um, between October and December, but it quickly recovered. Can, can I just give you those figures? Yeah. The... Um, 
because I was stunned when I read this. Uh, when the the market's peak was at 380 and it went to 120. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the days of 25,000, <laughs> the halcyon days are, are in the future. Yeah. Buy low, sell high. Uh, yeah, we should have all bought at 120. Oh, well. So what were, um, uh, I don't know, did you have any different leadership thoughts or expand on kind of what I thought? Well, I, th- I thought that uh, he was a, he's a, Morgan's intervention here was uh, both timely and uh, possibly unique to its place in time, uh, that a man had that much power um, and that good a reputation that uh, John D. Rockefeller would just call up and say, where do you need it? Here's 50 million bucks. Um, you know, that, I think that I don't think that person still exists. Doesn't happen in the club. <laughs> Not the club. Well, of course, the, the equivalent would now be several billion. But it's, <laughs> yeah. Did that call to Elon Musk didn't go through? No, he's not taking my calls anymore. I don't know why. Well, um, I guess um, maybe we could wrap up with a few themes that we've seen over these past four podcasts. Um, a couple of things seem to be in each one of those, and, and we've mentioned it each time was the. Um, lack of skin in the game or the ability to buy into whatever was being sold, <clears throat> whether it be a tulip bulb, a future, uh, a stock, a, a debtedness, a subscription, uh, with very little uh, money down from as low as 2.5% to 10% to 20%. If you have that kind of uh, uh, margin, you're going to have difficulty uh, if there's ever a call. Yeah. Government intervention often backfires, I think, is the other lesson. And that was, um, I struggle with that question in the 1907 example, um, because there, there was some government uh, assistance, I yes. wouldn't say intervention, but the intervention was largely led by private actors. And that may be the last time we've seen that in American history. Well, and the government intervention was small, but rapid, timely, uh, in the case of a crisis, it had to be that... They didn't go through any notice and comment period before doing it. They just made a phone call. Um, I think that's probably gone for better or worse. Um, you can't fix greed, I think, is the other lesson from all these. Um, and that if you think you're so smart that you can see one of these coming, you're probably mistaken. <laughs> it's different this time? <laughs> yeah. There's a new paradigm now. Well, this has been a fascinating series, Richard. I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it, too. Um, as Tom's pointed out, the, the Federal Reserve materials are absolutely fascinating. They're very comprehensive. The Fullenkamp lectures are not as detailed, but they give a fantastic overview, and they cover a, a whole lot more than we've covered in these podcasts. Um, so if you, if you have any interest in this topic, I, I recommend those as well. For now, this is Richard Lummis and Tom Fox with 12 O'Clock High. We hope you listen in next time. This is Paris Fox again. We hope you enjoyed this episode of 12 O'Clock High, a podcast on business leadership with Tom Fox. If you enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and rate the podcast. Thank you for listening. 